public accountant and actually president of the Pennsylvania Institute of CPAs. And her lovely assistant, Peter Calcara. <laughs> Isn't he lovely? <laughs> You're Good morning. Join her, Peter, if you wish. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to address the, uh, your committee this morning. Uh, my name is Sherry Free, and I am currently the president of the Pennsylvania Institute of CPAs, PICPA, and I'm also a principal with the firm of Hutchinson, Gillahan and Free, and we're located in Quakertown, Pennsylvania. You have a written testimony. Um, for the sake of time, I do want to just make a few comments. I'm not going to read the testimony. Uh, Usually, PICPA prefers to uh, be an objective resource for legislators in terms of uh, items that are in bills. And we, we try not to take a position one way or another because we want to maintain that objectivity. However, um, there are some things in this bill that, that are seriously detrimental to our membership, so we do have to express some concern. Uh, specifically as it relates to the language expanding the sales tax base to include services. Um, overall, we, we applaud you and your efforts to try to address the real estate tax situation. Um, actually, our membership, many of our members have said all along, you should just get rid of all Act 511 taxes and replace it with an increased PIT. I mean, we are not opposed to the general um, concept of this legislation. We do have some serious concerns about the, the, uh, the taxation of services and specifically the expansion of the sales tax base. Um, in particular, the, with the advanced technology that's, uh, that is available today, the there's been a lot of loss of jobs in the accounting sector to overseas uh, places to, uh, due to outsourcing uh, to offshore service providers. And our concern is that this would not only be to offshore, that, be, that if a sales tax is imposed on our services in the state, that it would now be, we'd be losing jobs to people out of state. I have a lot of clients ac across the country. They don't even come into Pennsylvania. They scan and email me their information to do a tax return. Um, I've got clients in Florida, Arizona, Ohio. And if we suddenly have to start imposing a sales tax on that service, I'm going to lose those clients. We're going to lose the revenue in Pennsylvania. And you multiply that by a significant number of people who do tax preparation uh, in Pennsylvania. Now, I am talking specifically because I know that the bill does include a business-to-business -business, uh, exemption. In all honesty, I'm not sure how that would work because of the uniformity clause. I, 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 I don't know anything about that. I just know Representative Mundy had brought up why is it that the real estate taxes have to be uh, across the board. I know it's because of the uniformity clause in the, in the Constitution. I'm not sure how that would apply to a business-to-business -business exemption in terms of taxpayers. So um, I won't go into that. But the other thing I want to point out is that um, business as defined, you know, the definitions I've seen in here are a bit unclear. Um, I do believe that charitable organizations would not qualify as a business. And in essence, you would be raising taxes on charitable organizations, your fire companies, your EMS squads, your homeless shelters, your churches potentially, PTAs. Um, they are all users of accounting services, and they would not receive an exemption. Now, uh, charitable organizations do get an exemption from sales tax for purchases made directly related to their exempt purpose, but they don't get a sales tax exemption on administrative costs or fundraising costs. So they would be subject to this tax. Um, also, as we've mentioned previously, the administrative nightmare. Uh, you know, you've got, OK, a service. You know, I was trying to think of services that are going to be subject to this tax, and the first, one of the first things that came to mind was my, my daughter's soccer team. The little soccer kid's out playing, and uh, they pay $10 to a teenager to referee the game. Well, that's a service. That would be subject to tax. Um, you know, there's you know, schools having to, cut, having to cut programs if parents want to pay, pay for music lessons for their child, if they want to supplement their child's education through tutoring, that type of thing, subject to tax. Our biggest concern is that that is an unknown quantity. Uh, this past year, the Pennsylvania Department of Revenue added a line to the Pennsylvania income tax return to uh, help in collecting use tax, which is the situation where if somebody purchases an out-of-state service and they have to, and, and they use it in Pennsylvania, they're supposed to 
pay that in. Uh, revenue estimates were done, and and when actual revenues were compared to the revenue estimates, they took in about half of what they had anticipated. So I just question um, the ability to measure the amount of income that's going to be generated by an expansion in the sales tax base because it's an unknown quantity. Now. Increasing the sales tax on the known base would be a known quantity. Increasing the personal income tax would be a known quantity, generally. Um, the expansion of the sales tax base is, is our big concern, because we really don't see how that can even be quantified properly. Um, so in, in closing, I do just want to point out, we do want to learn something from the past. In our testimony, we, we referenced that uh, back in the Casey administration, a sales tax on computer services was implemented that was devastating to Pennsylvania. It, it resulted in the loss of a lot of jobs, and it was almost immediately repealed. But uh, we're still recovering from some of that. So uh, we're, we're just recommending that you take a very close look. We, we, we are in opposition to the sales tax on the services in general and overall the ability to expand the sales tax base with a known quantifiable amount. So if there are any questions? Uh, yes, we have a couple. I apologize. We have a couple. And actually, I'm going to throw one out there quickly. Uh, you did a great job trying to summarize. But uh, I'd just like to expand a little bit on your uh, comment on, I think it's page 3. It says about the pyramiding effect. Uh, in the bill, I believe there was a provision that said that business to business transactions are exempt. Uh, do you see that relieving any concerns about the pyramiding? A business to business exemption would assist. I'm not going to kid you. I'm, you know, that would be helpful. Um, it's not going to address the administrative nightmare that's going to be caused by it. Uh, it's not going to address the fact that we could be losing jobs out of state. But in terms of businesses charging taxes on other businesses, then yes, it could potentially do away with that. And your comment about the pyramiding effect, does that help to address any of that? I'm not quite uh, sure. It says I about taxing on a tax on top of a tax. Peter, you're welcome to jump in. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the uh, exempting the, the business to business, uh, the business visit exemption is a, is a, a step in, in that direction. However, the concern we have too is once that is part, um, uh, once you do uh, subject uh, sales tax to uh, accounting services on an individual level. What's there to say that it's not going to be eventually be expanded at some point too, if, if the numbers don't add up to uh, business to business transactions? Thank you for that clarification. Uh, here, Representative Monday and Representative Davidson, did you have a question as well? No. Okay, Representative Chairwoman Monday. Um, thank you for your testimony. I'm interested. You talked about your out of state clients. Do any of the other states that you do business with or that you're aware of um, impose a tax on services? Not that I'm aware of. There are a small handful of states that do oppose, oppose, impose tax on a broad base of services. I could get you that list. It's, I, I believe it's a handful, maybe five. Uh, and most of them are very small states. Uh, and like you, Wyoming. you have to have nexus, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, in our situation, I don't have nexus. I have not set foot in their state. I'm not seeing them personally. So we are not subject to that tax. Um, but they would potentially in those states be subject to a report, self-reporting use tax type situation. So none, I'm sorry. Possibly. Yeah. <laughs> and, and none of the surrounding states, I'm, I'm pretty sure, do have a tax on uh, professional services. Thank you. You guys hit a home run. It looks like no other questions. We thank you both for your testimony. You. Thank you. Next, we have Dr. David Devar, 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 Director of Research for Pennsylvania School Board Association. Thank you for joining us, and feel free to start when you're comfortable. I'm going to move that a little bit. I have a tendency to hit microphones from time to time. Chairman Benninghoff, Co-Chairwoman Mundy, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. As stated, I'm Dave DeVar. I'm the Director of Research Services at PSBA. Uh, while PSBA supports the concept of diversifying the tax base, uh, unfortunately our association does not support or will not support any proposal that is a 100% elimination of the property tax. Uh, we feel that the property tax is a very stable base uh, and uh, rightly so uh, should be available to school districts as long, along with the uh, other municipal governments. 
I'm not going to read all of my testimony. I'm going to highlight a couple of things. Uh, as I indicated, we do rely too heavily on property taxes. Some of that is because of the mandates that school districts need to operate under. Uh, Chairwoman Mundy, thank you very much for the brief summary of the uh, tax reform attempts. That saves me uh, even addressing that. I, I, uh, I was around and, and did do work under the Casey plan, the 88-89 attempt to tax reform. And you're correct, there, there is a poor track record of voters approving a shift in the EIT, PIT. And in fact, uh, we have the opportunity under a bill that came out in 2001 and, and additionally revised in 2002 to repeal the occupation assessment, the millage based tax. Uh, when I started at PSBA, there were 110 districts that are levying that tax. There are still 39 districts levying that tax, and many of them have put out ballot questions, and the people would not accept that transition as well. So, you know, that's just another, uh, another uh, situation. One of the biggest things that we're concerned about under uh, House Bill 1776, and Representative Cox, we do thank you for your effort on this behalf. Uh, is the shift away from businesses onto individuals. Uh, in Pennsylvania, on a statewide basis, about 70% of all assessed value is residential property, and that would include the lots that people purchase uh, in urban areas that are right beside their lot to give them a slightly bigger area. Uh, so that means that about 30% of the real estate tax would be shifted away from business onto individual taxpayers. Uh, if you'll look at table one in my testimony, I present a, uh, a brief summary of how that works. And what that does is that shifts uh, roughly 2.6 to $3.2 million. That's 25 to 30% range. Uh, that means that in a PIT on a statewide basis, that would require a 1 to a 1.2% PIT. Uh, on individuals to handle that shift. Uh, but bottom line is, is if I take the total number of tax returns that were listed by Department of Revenue in 2009, that's the most recent year that they have data for, uh, and this is total returns, including zero returns and those who uh, have tax forgiveness under the special provisions, uh, that means that that tax increase to offset that loss would be between 450 and $540 just to replace the lost real estate tax to school districts. Uh, as pointed out uh, uh, by uh, some of the business presenters here this morning, we have a concern in regard to the expansion of the sales and use tax. Uh, primarily our concern is the expansion of that tax to the point uh, that people are going to be required for uh, to gain additional licenses uh, as uh, the authority to serve as a tax collector for the Commonwealth. Uh, for that tax and also the additional filings that will be necessary to the Department of Revenue and we're not sure that the Department of Revenue is staffed sufficiently to handle the influx of demand for the licenses to collect the uh, real estate tax, or I'm sorry, the, the sales tax, uh, nor are they staffed to handle the expanded increase in returns quarterly and annual filings and any necessary audits that would go along with that. Uh, so that if the Department of Revenue has the authority to remove revenue from the expanded sales and use tax to cover their cost, uh, what does that truly leave for school districts? So we've got a concern about uh, those numbers in there. Uh, I've provided some additional tables that look at how this uh, bill reacts to individual school districts. Uh, according to the testimony this morning, this is going to be on a statewide basis and the dollars are there supposedly from the expansion of sales tax and a 0.94% increase in the, in the PIT. Uh, unfortunately, we do not read the bill in the same manner and we believe districts are going to have to pick up a substantial portion uh, on the EIT. Uh, Representative, Representative Cox, not to uh, be picking on your bill at this point, but uh, I've been through enough tax reforms to know the devil's always in the details and there is some concern in regard to how we're reading certain provisions in your legislation uh, and how you're intending them. We think there is a, uh, a concern or a mismatch in some cases. Uh, you know, as we put out before this committee before on several occasions, uh, PSBA would be willing to work with the committee, uh, individual members of the entire committee in terms of how this is read. One of the things that we don't want to get into when we find in other attempts at tax reform is the devil's in the details 
and the amount of effort uh, and necessity of training our our members and the general public as to what these tax reforms mean uh, under the uh, 98-2004-2006 attempt at tax reforms. I want to say that uh, our organization did somewhere in the neighborhood of 200 to 300 workshops all across the Commonwealth just trying to make sure our members and their corresponding taxpayers understood what was required of the school board. Uh, as the uh, gentleman from the Williamsport uh, newspaper uh, mentioned, there is a concern about people understanding what this means to them. Uh, and here again, uh, I think you know my view on, on tax reform is uh, people always want to try and understand, can I pay less? Am I going to pay less? And I think that's what they want from tax reform. But as the, news, as the gentleman from the newspaper stated, one of the issues is the cost. School boards are not free reign jurisdictions to make their own decisions. They are provided, they are mandated to provide a specific service. Uh, we cannot lay off teachers for financial reasons. That means we have to cut programs. We have to do whatever is required of the school district. That's both legislatively under the school code and regulatory from the Department of Education itself. Uh, we also have to deal with federal mandates. In Pennsylvania, a child from the ages of six to 21, if they are a special needs child, is the responsibility of the public school district. That means that we have to provide whatever is necessary to support that child. Uh, and unfortunately, that's not a cost that we can control. That's not a cost that the legislature can control. And in fact, I go back far enough that uh, when Governor Casey left, one of the crowning achievements in his administration, as, as he stated, was his ability to control the rising cost of special education at the state level. And that was controlled by passing it to local school districts. And as long as we keep getting those kinds of mandates, then school districts, unfortunately, are going to be in the position of having to say, we need more to operate. Yes, it's true the legislature has given school districts more money over time. Yes, it's true that school districts have increased real estate taxes over time. And in part, in part that's because the mandates that we face have, have imposed costs that are rising at a rate greater than state subsidy increases. Uh, it was talked about um, prior to the primary election. One of the key points I'll make in terms of a mandate has to do with prevailing wage. The, the cost of prevailing wage is such that as an individual, if I go out and I hire a contractor to install 10 feet of sidewalk, I get 10 feet of sidewalk. If I do it under prevailing wage, I only get eight feet of sidewalk, but I pay for 10. And it's those kinds of mandates that get imposed on school districts uh, that are forcing districts to spend. I have not met a school board member who was in a rush and willing to say, let's do nothing but raise taxes. Over the past two years, districts have cut programs and raised taxes. Some districts have not raised taxes, but they have severely cut programs. Uh, and with that, I will uh, close my comments and ask if there are any questions. Any questions from the members? Representative Davidson. Um, have you seen, uh, or can you elaborate on a reluctance of uh, school boards to cut administrative costs, um, superintendents, um, principals, uh, assistant principals? Um, have you seen a reluctance in, in cutting costs um, that would cause you to, to not be supportive of this kind of bill? Uh, no, uh, I have not seen a reluctance. Uh, understand, though, that a school district just can't eliminate the superintendent. There is a mandate that we have a superintendent. I mean, yeah. assistant superintendents. Assistant superintendents have been eliminated. The number of administrators, central office administration, over the last two years, those positions have been subject to eliminations. Uh, some districts have had some retirements, and they've announced this year they're not doing replacements. Uh, the school district I live in, West Shore School District, uh, has a business manager, an assistant business manager. The business manager is retiring this year. The board has announced they're promoting the assistant business manager and there will be no replacement for the assistant business manager. So we're seeing the administrative positions all across the state also being subject. Uh, but we also have districts 
by law, we're required to have a building principal for every building. And if we go into some districts, you're going to find uh, the elementary principal is not only principal in one building, but two or three buildings, especially in more so in rural communities is, is typically where we tend to see that. There are some small rural districts where the superintendent is also uh, the elementary principal. So we see a lot of, we hear a lot about the overflow of administrative cost, but a lot of that is primarily mandates. Okay, and do you provide any guidelines at, uh, to um, to school boards about how they can cut administrative costs or, or what what a, a acceptable ratio is? Uh, we provide information on what the what the ratios are, the different ratios or different rates of staffing, uh, but we've all also been supportive. Uh, the next speaker behind me is from uh, PASBO. They put out a couple of years ago 500 best practices, and we've supported school districts. Uh, we've encouraged school districts to look at those best practices and to the extent possible if they could implement them, uh, even to the point of having uh, a workshop at our annual conference where uh, one of the individuals responsible did a presentation on some of the different things. We also encourage shared services where a district or two districts would go together uh, instead of two districts having a curriculum, per each a, a curriculum person where they would share. We find a number of small districts are already sharing a lot of uh, unusual positions. There's a shared business manager, there's shared technology directors, shared curriculum people. Uh, we even had two school districts inquire and get approval from the Department of Education to share a superintendent. But uh, when the districts went back and took a look at that and the demands that they would be placing on one individual, uh, they felt that that was going to be problematic, at least at this point. But districts are looking for every way they can save. Um, just a final comment. Um, thank you for, for sharing that with me. I, I just haven't found that to be the case, maybe in some rural uh, areas that may be the case, but it, it's certainly not the case uh, in the school district that I'm representing where there's uh, two, two assistant superintendents. There's probably two assistant principals in a number of schools. There's not a whole lot of cost sharing. I don't believe that they're sharing with any of the other school districts and costs continue to rise and property taxes continue to go up. They raise property taxes every single year and cut programs. Teachers, 57, administrators, one. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that, that's my concern with, with spending. So I just and, wanted to make that comment for the record. Yeah, and, and let me point out that uh, with assistant principals, uh, sometimes it's the nature of the building that requires additional uh, assistance. Uh, typically, that is more common in a high school uh, where you may have uh, 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 an issue of discipline, historical issue of yeah, discipline problems. Uh, and uh, I can understand in, in some buildings where that might be necessary, one for each grade level. But that's, here again, part of that is local control. And I can't address you know the, any a specific district, but that does occur from time to time. Uh, very quickly, I have two quick questions. I was at a, a statewide school board association meeting several years ago, and I consistently hear the words fair and equitable funding thrown about, and I raised my hand and asked a question if someone could uh, explain what that meant. And uh, nobody seems to be able to explain what the word fair and equitable means, and therefore we have this kind of proverbial dog chasing its tail, and you need to give us more money, we'll spend less money. And we just never seem to get to the crux of the problem. It almost brings me to mind of Chairwoman Monday's earlier comment, if you were king for a day, what would you throw as a solution? I mean, this issue is not new. We continue to try to find uh, solutions. I think if you ask people they want to eliminate their taxes or lower them, they're always going to say yes. Mm -hmm. But are they want to have comparable reduction in services, or do they want to give up certain things that are going on? Because I think most people want their kids in the you know, premier school, and they want swimming pools and ball fields and everything else that they see in, in the neighboring schools. So, so it's difficult to provide those services for you. And for those of us who take money statewide and provide it to other school districts to provide all that if people aren't willing to pay for it. A fair and equitable, if I were to define it. Uh, unfortunately, I need to do what Representative Cox backed away from originally, and that was tie any kind of tax reform to a funding formula. And one of the big issues that we face right now is uh, we do not have a funding formula. It is it has tended to become last year plus. Over the years, we have attempted to 
change the funding formula and we get one governor who starts and the governor changes and the parties change and that gets called to a screeching halt and by the end of that term we start to see another reform and then we get the same thing so we see this repetitive nature uh, but I, I think unfortunately the two are inextricably linked together you need to talk about the capacity of the individual districts to generate their own revenue versus the ability of the state to provide a funding formula that addresses the needs of all the districts and the diversity of this state. Uh, my apologies, I would not want to be king for a day to do that. Well, I wouldn't want you to run for legislature either because it's not the decision's not any easier. But it's interesting that same meeting, and I'll, I'll try to end with this. Um, you know, the reality is we hear lots of people advocating, well, if we just get 50 percent of our funding, get 50 percent funding from the Commonwealth. The reality is a good portion of our school districts across the Commonwealth get over 50 percent of their funding and some up as high as 75 percent of the funding. And the uh, internal reality is the guys who have uh, districts in their legislative districts that make 75 percent of their money from the state sure aren't going to want to relinquish that. But at that particular same meeting, there was a school district from down the southeast who said, you know, we only get 10 percent of our funding from the state. Let us alone. Yeah. You know, we want to provide for our children, and if we want to add a pool or we want to put a gym on or we do, we do that through local taxation. And that's really part of the internal struggle we have here, mm -hmm. that there are those parochial ideologies, both within the legislature and outside within the school boards, who want to have a say within what they do, and I think they fear having some statewide control over all top of that. Yeah, I, um, in, in terms of the... Uh, Act 1 tax reform, I worked with two tax study commissions, one in suburban Philadelphia, one up in Erie County. Uh, yes, I did get them back to back one week. Uh, it's 457 miles from northwest to southeast. Uh, the, the issue there is that district made a conscious decision not to levy an EIT or a PIT to stay with the property tax because of the number of residents who work in Philadelphia and are subject to the Sterling Act tax. Uh, you've got the same thing up in the Poconos where you have some districts who have chosen not to levy the EIT because of the absentee landowners and the people from New York who own properties and rather than subsidize those properties through the local taxpayer paying an EIT, they have chosen not to. There are only 33 school districts left that do not levy an EIT at this point. One quick last question, if I may. Um, I have reservations on how do you get absentee landlords to relinquish properties if there is any financial punitive measure as in property taxes. If I got a guy who owns 10, 15 properties in my community, doesn't live in a state, and pays ultimately pay no property taxes, what gets them to turn those properties over and therefore helps a community not to have a bunch of blighted properties? I was a township manager many years ago. I wish I had an answer to that question because as the township manager, I had six properties exactly like that, and one was to the point of almost collapsing into a neighbor's house, and we couldn't get relinquish relinquishment to even do a demolition. We finally had to go to court to, to get demolition of the property under uh, health safety. Did those people pay property taxes on those properties at that point, or were they uh, negligent on that? They were negligent on their properties, but they have always managed to pay that third year in arrear just before sheriff sale. Do you imagine they have taken by eminent domain? Uh, we had we asked the court for permission to demolish the building for health safety reasons. Thank you. We appreciate your willingness to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Last but not least, we have uh, Jeffrey Mummert. I hope I said that properly from the uh, Pennsylvania Business Administrators and Board Secretary, Southwestern School District. Joining him will be Jay Himes, Executive Director of Pennsylvania Association of School Board Officials. While they are getting ready, I will also, for editorial purposes, let you know that we did receive uh, written comments from Lisa Shaver, Governmental Relations Manager for the Center County, for the County Commissioners Association. I'm not home right now. And for those who may leave before we finish, there will be another hearing on June 4th, probably within the same time period somewhere between 9 and 1 o'clock. Sir, if you are ready, feel free. Chairman Benninghoff and members of the House Finance Committee, thank you for inviting the Pennsylvania Association of School Business Officials, PASBO, to testify on House Bill 1776. My name is Jeff Mummert, and I am the Business Administrator of the Southwestern School District in York County. Effective July 1st, I'll become a member of PASBO's Board of Directors as well as Chair of its Legislative Committee, a committee on which I've served for eight years. 
PASPA's membership covers a wide spectrum of non-instructional disciplines required to support student achievement and classroom learning. More about our organization can be found at the end of my testimony. House Bill 1776 will eliminate property taxes in Pennsylvania by increasing the personal income tax from 3.07% to 4% and the state sales tax from 6% to 7%. While I'm not 100% certain, I would guess that if you took a poll of likely voters in Pennsylvania, the vast majority of them would indicate they are in favor of eliminating property taxes. I'm also, I would also bet that if you asked the same voters if they would be interested in paying more in total taxes, the vast majority of them would answer no. This is the quandary we find ourselves in regarding the issue of property taxes in the state. What is the fairest and most equitable way of generating revenue to pay for public services? Property taxes have historically funded local government services. They have been levied since the beginning of this country. Some people believe they are regressive in nature, although most economists would argue that a sales tax is more regressive, having a greater proportional negative impact on the poor. What we do know about property taxes is that they are very consistent, they are a very consistent and stable way of funding public services at a relatively low cost to collect. Our district pays about $36,000 to collect about $30 million in property taxes, which is about one-tenth of 1%. One property taxes affect everyone, senior citizens on a fixed income, families and individuals who own a home, renters and businesses. Almost everyone pays property taxes for public services. Is it the only way to pay for public services? Probably not. But coming up with an alternative plan hasn't been easy either, or I would guess that we would already have an alternative in place. The plan in House Bill 1776 is a drastic and unworkable departure from our current method of funding education. It is drastic from the perspective that the local property tax base gives local officials some degree of local discretion for addressing local priorities will be cast off and replaced with a state-controlled tax base where local dollars are redistributed back to where they were collected. This legislation makes Harrisburg the big tax collector of all school district revenues. It is a big government solution that wrecks local discretion. Currently, property taxes are collected locally and the money stays local. I believe there is general distrust across the Commonwealth by schools when it comes to having the state collect and distribute education funds. The distribution method of state funds has always been a bone of contention in the central part of the state, as many of us are convinced that much of our tax revenues are actually being diverted to the Philadelphia and Pittsburgh areas instead of coming back to central Pennsylvania. State collection and distribution also begs the question of how this plan could be possibly implemented just from a cash flow perspective. Increasing the state's personal income and sales tax will have to provide about $11 billion in new revenues to replace existing school property taxes. House Bill 1776 calls for quarterly payments to be made to districts. So will the state guarantee that there will be nearly $3 billion generated in the first quarter of the year, or is the state willing to provide the funding from reserves or other sources? Even if the answer to either of these questions is yes, has there been any consideration to the drastic consequences of spreading out property taxes that are collected primarily in the first four months of the fiscal year to a system of quarterly state payments? <coughs> Further. Is there any consideration to how uh, districts should budget? Currently, the property tax provides not only a fairly stable revenue base, but a predictable one as well. I believe that quarterly distribution of state funds replacing property taxes will create havoc for school budgets. The other state distribution concern that I don't see specifically addressed in House Bill 1776 is related to whether the state will distribute those tax revenues to school districts when the General Assembly and Governor are unable to approve a state budget in a timely manner. It wasn't that long ago that school districts had to wait until October to get state revenues due to a budget impasse. We were able to make it through that disruption as we were still collecting property tax revenues in August and September. Now while many people will hear about the elimination of property taxes, this bill is not about eliminating taxes but rather shifting taxes from one type to another. And we say eliminate property taxes, let's be clear. We're only talking about eliminating school district property taxes, and only after two years, and only completely after all outstanding debt has been paid. Evidently, it is just fine to continue to pay county and municipal property taxes, many of which have seen double-digit percent increases the past few years, as they are not part of this bill. As you know, school districts are limited in our property tax increase amounts as a result of Act 1 of 2006. So property taxes will not be eliminated in total, only school district property taxes will be eliminated. Property owners will still receive a property tax bill each year 
for their county and municipal property taxes over which there are no laws to control increases. Anytime you have a shift in tax burden from one type to another, you create winners and losers. You might think that eliminating school property taxes would make everyone a winner, but mathematically that just isn't the case. Like most bill bills dealing with shifting of taxes, the intent of House Bill 1776, when it is all said and done, is to be tax neutral. Essentially, the amount of revenues generated by an increase in the personal income tax and increase in sales tax and the expansion of the goods and services covered by the sales tax should be about the same as the amount lost from the elimination of the property taxes. In reading House Bill 1776, I noticed a few things regarding this issue that raises a few operational questions. First, the elimination of the school property tax will occur over a two-year period of time. And actually, if a school district has debt that is paying for construction projects, they would be able to continue to have property tax to cover that debt service cost until that debt service is paid off. So let me clarify this. House Bill 1776 proposes to eliminate school property taxes with a shift to higher personal income taxes and, and sales taxes. And yet if your school district has outstanding debt, you'll be able to have a property tax that covers the cost of that debt service until it is paid off. We'll come back to this in a minute. Let's get back to the math. It is a given that most individuals will pay more in total taxes as a result of House Bill 1776 than they do now. It's simple math, something we all learned in school. If we eliminate the school property tax, the big winners will be businesses and commercial property owners as they will have a decrease in taxes with no corresponding tax increase. Assuming that the financial need for funding education doesn't decrease, the revenues lost from the elimination of property taxes for businesses and commercial properties will need to be made up. And that tax amount will come from individuals. So when you do the math, there's no question that under House Bill 1776, most of us will pay more in total taxes than we pay now. I found the examples of referendum questions contained in the bill to be very interesting. On page 12, for example, the bill gives us the sample referendum question, do you favor the imposition of a personal income tax of X percent? Similar referendum questions are outlined for an earned income tax and net profits tax. I would suggest that a more accurate referendum question for voters would be, do you dislike the current school district property tax so much that you are willing to pay more in total taxes to fund education? To me, that is at the heart of this question. Actually, what concerns me personally, other than the concept of having to pay more in taxes than I pay now to cover the lost revenues from commercial and industrial property taxes that would be eliminated, is what I call the double whammy effect. The double whammy I'm referring to is the twofold concern that not only will most people pay more in total taxes, but that when crafting this legislation, the General Assembly will not make the tax rates high enough to provide sufficient revenues to make up for the lost school property taxes. Again, from an operational standpoint, will House Bill 1776 provide sufficient offsetting personal tax revenues in year one to cover the lost school district property taxes? Or will that total revenue stream reach the total offset in year two? As school districts with outstanding debt have their debt get paid in full and they eliminate the remainder of their property tax, will there be a mechanism in place to provide for those additional offsetting revenues from personal taxes. What mechanism will be in place to provide that district with the additional revenue? What happens when we go into recession and personal tax collections decline? What provisions are included in House Bill 1776 to provide adequate funding for public education at a time when the expectations of public education are increasing? There's one more thing I'd like to bring to the attention of the committee. I've heard many people comment that the reason this significant shift in funding education is needed is that people across the Commonwealth are losing their homes as a result of rising school property taxes. While this makes for a powerful soundbite, I'm not sure the facts support this claim. I've done some research on this issue, both for my school district and for your county. I'll start with my district. We currently have 11,384 taxable properties on our tax roll. This year, eight of those properties were exposed to tax upset sale, and of that number, only three are actually going to tax upset sale. And while I don't want to see anyone lose their property because of taxes, that is a very, very small number. That equates to 0. .00026, or less than three one-hundredths of one percent. The statistics in your county as provided by the T County Tax Claim Bureau are equally compelling. 
Currently, there are 180 properties scheduled to go to tax upset sale out of 181,347 taxable parcels in the county. And that number is likely to go down before the time of the sale. That equates to about one-tenth of 1%, or 0 .000925. I'm guessing that some of you may have worked in factories at some point in your lives. I did one summer while I was going to college. Do you believe that there are any factories in the Commonwealth that would stop their assembly lines if one-tenth of 1% 1 of the items they are making were flawed, or if the bag or can was filled one-tenth of 1% 1 from the top? Again, we're talking about one in a thousand. If you get a box of a thousand apples and you find one of them is bad, do you send them back? I don't think so. Some other information to pass along from the Tax Claim Bureau. Of the properties that do go to upset sale and are sold, the majority of those, of those transactions get appealed and then people get their property back. One last item along these lines. According to the Prothonotary's office, there are any number of reasons why liens get placed on properties. It's not just because of school district property taxes. Interestingly enough, if a person fails to pay their state income tax, while their wages usually get garnished first, the state also has the ability to place a lien on your property for failure to pay taxes. So I'm left scratching my head. What are we accomplishing with this bill? The last item I'd like to address regarding House Bill 1776 is the referendum requirements. If my memory serves me correctly, it wasn't all that long ago that school districts were required under Act 1 to place a referendum question on the ballot to see if our residents wanted the school district um, to levy a higher earned income tax or collect a personal income tax to help, help reduce property taxes. I believe voters in only eight or nine school districts in the Commonwealth voted to approve that tax shift. What has changed in the last six years to lead us to believe there will be a different outcome? Perhaps the fairest approach would be to continue to allow businesses and commercial properties to pay property taxes while shifting the residential and farm property taxes to the personal income tax. Farmers may have a bit of a problem with this as they do enjoy the tax benefits of the Clean and Green program. But this approach would shift taxes within the same group of people, so it would be less likely that most people would pay more in total taxes. I'm guessing it's discriminatory to have just commercial and industrial properties paying school property taxes, but I'll let it up to you folks. Thank you again for your time and for listening to my concerns. Thank you, sir. Your organization uh, benefits from your good testimony and obviously your passion for the issue. Questions from anybody specifically? Just Chairwoman Monday? Just a quick comment. And, and you know, I... I totally understand your point that um, property taxes are a stable source of income for the districts. But I guess I would argue that going to a tax sale isn't, or losing your home as a result of a tax sale isn't the only way you lose your home. Right. You, you might lose it because you simply can't afford that much out of your disposable income to pay the taxes. So you have to move to an apartment. You have to move in with a family member if you're elderly. So I do believe that the property tax is very regressive, and it is the most regressive. Because even though a sales tax is also regressive in the sense of how it impacts the poorest among us, at least for the middle, the middle income individual, it's somewhat determined by how much you buy. So it is a problem. It really is a problem, especially, I mean, my area is very elderly. And it gets more expensive to upkeep your home and to pay the taxes when they increase year after year and your income doesn't. So it is a problem. Um, I, I guess. I'd ask you, my only question to you would be, what are the school districts doing about this out of control spending? Um, and I'm gonna touch the third rail of um, school funding issues, and that is IDEA, special education, pensions, um, and how we fund school districts at the state level. Um, and I would disagree with some of my colleagues. Um, I did not vote for the pension increase. Um, I saw this as a huge problem going forward. Um, but that has increased school district costs, 
and we did that here. We didn't. They, local districts didn't increase the pension multiplier, um, and of course, IDEA is mostly federal in nature. So, what do you do at the school district level to address those costs? Um, you know, the the mandate that I continually hear about is prevailing wage, but my districts aren't doing a lot of construction um, or repairs that require prevailing wage. So it, it, that is not the reason in my districts that um, you're seeing property taxes increase. So can you sort of address those concerns? I'll do my best for you. Um, school district budgets are still rising. And I think the primary impact, at least in, in my school district, is uh, pension costs, um, and the state deals with that as well, since you fund a portion of that increase. Um, I would say health insurance cost increases are also a significant driving factor. Um, salaries in the past have been a significant factor, but we are starting to see curbing of that. We just negotiated a contract uh, with our um, collective bargaining agreement with our teachers union uh, for a freeze for next year, 0%, and a 1.5% the following year. So I think that there are uh, significant steps being made to address uh, that particular um, line item in your budget because that's, let's face it, the biggest of all of our expansion items. Special ed is going to continue to be uh, an increasing cost, I believe, um, and it's one that's a mandated cost both at um, primarily at the federal level where we have no control. Um, it's, it's quite frankly, it's the one area in the budget where um, if they have to do it to meet some requirement, we spend the money and we look for it someplace else. So what are we doing? We're uh, curbing our allocations, trying to reduce what we actually allow the schools to have to operate their programs. We are uh, cutting other areas of the budget. Primarily maintenance has been slashed pretty badly. Technology has been slashed pretty badly um, in order to try to provide a, a balanced budget approach if you can. And we're still using fund balance in order to help balance our budgets because you, c you just can't, you can't do it with just tax increases. I mean, Act 1, Act 1 has, you know, put a limitation on what you can do with property tax increases. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, it's, but it is something that is limiting what we're able to do from that perspective. So you're going to have to use all types of resources and you're going to also have to cut expenditures. I'm not sure if that answers all your questions. Well, you know, it was a multifaceted question. And I mean, we can identify the problem. The problem's not identifying the problem. We know what the problem is. The solution is the elusive part. Um, so many different situations in the school districts with regard to funding and um, the ability to pay. Um, you have, I'm sorry. Right, demographics. Um, and personally, I am a proponent of strong academic uh, standards for schools. You know, I am a proponent of paying teachers a reasonable salary so that we can attract the best and the brightest to public education. Uh, we keep increasing the requirements to become a teacher, to stay a teacher. Um, and, you know, at some point when you freeze salaries, you know, I'm sure that in some districts salaries are rather high. But um, what is the, the beginning salary for a teacher in Pennsylvania? Um, the, I think the mandated requirement is $18,000 a year. Now, very few districts pay that, but coming out of college with a four-year debt burden, um, you're going to expect to get a reasonable salary uh, just to pay off your college loans, especially today. So, um, well, thank you for your testimony. This has been an intractable problem for the 30 years I've been working on it, and um, I guess we'll, we'll see how far this bill goes. Thanks. And a quick question. Uh, in your testimony, you, you also used the word adequate. Want to take a shot at trying to define the word adequate funding? Good question. Well, um, as the previous speaker uh, indicated, uh, adequate is a tough thing to put a uh, handle on. Um, 
we've been told over the years uh, that, uh, I'll go back in history, back in the early 70s, the state was providing 50% uh, on average funding for public education. And that number has come down, I'm going to take a stab at it, somewhere around 35%. I'm not sure if that's factually correct. I know in our district, the state um, pays about 35% of our funding. Um, is it adequate? I think everybody that comes before you will ask for more money. Uh, I think the state has limited resources. Um, I, I consider myself fairly conservative from that perspective. So um, while I think everyone would like to see more funding, I don't know that I can give you a definition of adequate. I appreciate that. Uh, one follow-up to that, if I might. Um, we heard a number around $12.7 billion property taxes generated to help fund schools, but yet there's still uh, about $3 billion plus sitting in reserve dollars. That's about 25% of that number needed on an annual basis. What do you say to the taxpayers when there's that kind of money being sat on in reserves? And, you know, do we need to be looking at maybe reducing that amount of money that could be set in reserves? Um, I've never liked anybody in a taxing authority's position to have a lot of reserve dollars. That's to me always represented over taxation somewhere along the line. But I'd be curious of your take on that. Well, that's a great question uh, from a number of different perspectives. And at the school district level, I can tell you that we have nine board members that uh, debate that uh, issue very heavily every year for the budget. Uh, currently, uh, we are limited to 8% of our expenditure level for a fund balance. In our school district, it's a little less than that. And uh, if you think about uh, the 8% level, that's essentially one month of operating expenditures. Um, it seems like a lot of money because you're talking about millions of dollars, but from my perspective, one month isn't a lot. Uh, our CPA firm, uh, prior to the limitations uh, placed on us as far as um, fund balances, would normally recommend between 8 and 12% or more. The higher it was, the happier they were. Um, but it is a delicate balance because, again, I don't think there's any elected school board member, at least I'd argue there are very few that I'm aware of, who want to tax people. They're, they're taxing themselves. And so there's no incentive for them to do this. I mean, I don't see any reason why people just want to go out there and tax people. Uh, you, you win points for not taxing or not raising taxes. So I think the fund balance issue becomes a delicate balancing act. You want to make sure you are fiscally sound. You want to make sure you have funds available in the event of unforeseen situations. Um, I, again, the, you know, the budget impasse of a couple of years ago is a good example. And um, I, I don't know who has higher fund balances or not, but again, I think the eight percent level is a. I think the eight percent level is um, not unrealistic. I appreciate your candor, uh, Representative Chairman. Monday is going to follow up my question, and Representative Cox will be our cleanup batter. Well, I, I just, you know, we're talking about what's adequate. Well, I thought we did a costing out study as to what adequate meant. Um, we commissioned the study. We did the study. We began to implement um, what we believed was adequate um, and necessary funding for what it would take to give students in Pennsylvania a good, high-quality education, um, to me, that, what, that is what adequate was about. That's how we determined what adequate meant. Now, you know, we're, we've had a lot of turnover in the legislature since then, and I guess people aren't aware that we did that costing out study, but it wasn't all that long ago. So adequate is, you know, based on those numbers. So... Now, I, I totally understand what, what people mean when they say 50%. 50% of what? Whatever the local districts want to spend? That's probably not reasonable either. But the costing out study was meant to determine what adequate means. So if we use that as a starting point, and that was several years ago now, and I don't know if that is still... What means what adequate means, but it, it, it certainly is a starting point for the discussion. Representative Davidson. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. I just had a couple of questions related to um, your testimony. Uh, you referenced your particular school district uh, a few times. Uh, how, how much is uh, the average tax 
uh, in your school district for uh, homeowners? The average tax for a homeowner in our school district is about $2,600. Okay, so that's property tax. It's probably relatively low or mid range across the state, I would say. We're one of the lowest in our county. Uh, our board has, um, I, I would say that our board has done a, an exceptional job of uh, being fiscally responsible to the taxpayers and uh, they strive to keep the tax rates as low as possible. Um, I'm sure there are others in the county that are higher, but we are one of the lowest. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like it. And uh, what percentage of your budget comes from those property taxes versus the state? We get roughly 56% of our budget, 55 to 56% from property taxes. It might be a little higher than that. And we get about 35% from the state. Okay. And um, in reference to property taxes, have you, <clears throat> have you seen, <clears throat> excuse me, have you seen a lot of shrinkage? Uh, and your collection of property taxes, I've, I've noticed in some school districts, as the taxes go higher, um, their ability to collect those tax taxes go low, uh, go lower. So are you seeing that in your school district as well? Our collection percent has gone down slightly from perhaps 97% to 96.8, 96.9, but it hasn't been dramatic. What has been dramatic is the level of growth of our assessment base. Uh, we were collecting, we were getting assessment growth in, and uh, keep in mind, I'm in South Central Pennsylvania. There's lots of farms that are being converted into housing developments. Currently, we have th some 3,500 houses on the books to be developed once we get past the sewer moratorium and once the economy improves. Um, so we're somewhat blessed from that perspective. Um, but we were seeing uh, assessment increases of 3% on an annual basis, and with this recession, the most recent recession, we saw that number drop down to 0.75%. So we saw a significant downturn in the growth of assessments. Um, I would say that wasn't a significant, at least in my mind, it wasn't a significant change in the collection percentage for real estate taxes. We've been lucky from that perspective. And again, that's evident by the um, numbers I gave you for the number of properties going to tax upset sale. We don't have a lot of that as a problem either. Okay, but you are seeing um, some reduction in the amount of property taxes you're be able to connect, uh, collect and then um, the assessments are, are going down, so. Um. The assessments now are starting to come back up again. We're seeing a shift uh, in that, and I'm not sure if I can attribute that to any long-term economic improvement or the building of a huge target <laughs> in our district, which attributed about $10 million to our assessed value this year. Um, so I don't know yet without seeing another year's worth of data whether we are starting to trend up because of the economy. Uh, it is a true statement to say that our collection percentage has declined slightly. Thank you. I have to ask, uh, quick math, 55% of your money is generated, <coughs> property taxes 35 from the state. Where do you get your other 10? If my math. Well, not from federal. <laughs> I get about any other taxes that you. Uh, you sure are. EIT. We get about three million dollars a year in EIT. Um, we get. But the rate of that is one percent. We're at one percent. Um, we get some delinquent tax collections, about seven hundred seventy-five thousand dollars. Interest earnings have dwindled to next to nothing now. I think we get seventy seventy-five thousand uh, dollars. Federal revenues, we get about three to four hundred thousand dollars, which is about one percent. Less than one percent. Um, trying to think of the other major sources. I can't think of them off the top of my head. You're uh, you're close enough, and I appreciate that uh, filling in the rest of the information. Sure. Thank you, uh, Representative Cox. I believe would like to round things up. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I'd like to offer some comments in regard to your testimony. Um, <coughs> take issue with a few of them. Um, in the course of working on this legislation, I continue to hear the term stable and predictable for school property taxes. And while I agree with you from a practical standpoint that they are in fact stable and predictable because people pay them the collection uh, rate, you mentioned 97%, 96.8, wherever you end up landing, it's still a, a very high collection uh, percentage. And I think what we fail as legislators often to do is to take a look at why a tax is so stable and why a tax is so predictable. And what 
my constituents tell me and what constituents of, of a lot of the members of the House tell them is that the reason it's stable and predictable is because it's the threat of losing their home. It's the first tax they pay. They'd rather evade income taxes on some level, you know, skip reporting this or that, and, you know, obviously they're not going to tell us all the ins and outs of that, but when you look at a tax being stable and predictable, I can walk around this room with a loaded shotgun and have fairly stable and predictable results as to how many people with a gun pointed at their face are going to hand me their money. And while losing your home may not rise to the, to the level of losing your life, it's a significant loss. And it's a loss that I'm no longer willing to allow Pennsylvanians to be faced with. Uh, people will go through any, any possible changes in their lives. They will go back to work after being retired for years. They will uh, put a second mortgage uh, or they'll put a mortgage back on their home. They'll get a reverse mortgage. Um, you know, they'll, they'll do just about anything. They'll go into their retirement savings, all just to save their homes. And so the, the stable, predictable part of the property tax, I, I understand that, yes, in fact, it is. But I think it's egregious that we as a legislature would allow that to continue. And that is one of the reasons, it's the primary reason why I put this bill out there. Uh, the time has come to give property owners a little more security in their homes. You also mentioned that, you know, you find it funny that we're not going after local and county taxes. As you can imagine, that's a little bit larger financial nut to crack. And I can count on one hand, uh, I can probably count on one hand, the number of legislators uh, in the House that have had people come into their offices screaming about either their local or their county property taxes. They've not yet risen to the level of being uh, threatening to them. And so, uh, you know, in, in our position as legislators, you, you tackle the the big egg first and try to crack it and figure out how to fry it and and uh, do whatever we're going to do with it. And so while I would love to have this be an all sweeping approach, because I do think ownership uh, is compromised by any property tax, um, we have to have to figure out a starting point and school property taxes are the are the most uh, damaging. The other comment you made repeatedly in your testimony was that people will end up paying more in total taxes. Um, I'm going to toss out some fairly basic numbers in, in trying to keep this simple. Um, I'm going to start with a household income of $100,000, you know, whether that's one or two people working. Let's say it's a $100,000 household income, and let's say their property taxes are $5,000. If they have $75,000 of that $100,000 that's available to them to spend in one way or another, let's take a look at the impact there. On $100,000, a 1% increase, which we're doing a little bit less, a 1% increase in the personal income tax would be an additional $1,000 in personal income tax. If we look at only... 25, and I'm lopsiding this on purpose for effect. If we say of their $75,000 in disposable income, they use $25,000 of that on only existing sales and income tax uh, or, or sales and use tax purchases. Uh, the goods that they're buying are already taxed with that $25,000. That comes up to $250 as an increase because we're going up 1%. So our total right now is $1,250. That's before we look at any new sales and use tax, the expanded base, et cetera. Even if they somehow find a way to spend $50,000 on goods and services that are not currently taxed, even if they can spend $50,000 on new, newly taxable items, that still only brings in $3,500 for the state. And so the grand total there is $4,750. They got rid of a $5,000 property tax bill. They're $250 on the high side. And, and I believe that to be an exaggerated account of 
people's disposable income and so forth. And so I'm really struggling. As I mentioned in my earlier testimony, I, I know there are going to be some people in some areas that have uh, incredibly low property taxes. Maybe the guy making $100,000 in your district or the family making $100,000 is only paying $2,000 in property taxes. And so somehow they're going to you know, see a little bit of a, of a net uh, loss in that sense. So I, I can't sit here and say that this legislation will not have any losers. Uh, but what I can do is say that we'll place the burden more squarely on the shoulders of those who do have the continuing ability to pay, those who are employed, those who are making choices about what they're spending. Um, and so the consumption tax is probably one of the most fair. When you look at a sales tax, I get to decide whether I want to shop at that new Target or Walmart or wherever the case may be. So the choice is mine as far as when I'm spending, how much I'm spending, and it leaves me in control. And there's one thing that people need in this economy, and that's stability, uh, stability to stay in their homes, stability to make choices of when and how they spend. And so I, I would challenge um, your statement that people will pay more in total taxes. Uh, by and large, uh, David Baldinger's site, uh, ptcc.us, has a calculator on it. Uh, there will be some people that go on the website and punch in their numbers, and they end up showing that they, they lose 150 250 bucks, but they like the fact that they own their home, so that they're supportive of this bill. Um, there will be, by and large, a huge number of people, though, huge numbers of people that will benefit from home ownership and a financial benefit of a broadening of the base, uh, you know, 3 million taxpayers versus 12 million taxpayers. The math is pretty simple there when you're spreading it across 12 million shoulders rather than 3 million. Uh, and that's not even to mention anybody coming in from outside the state uh, who will pay those additional sales taxes. And so uh, I appreciate your testimony, but I do, uh, I do disagree with uh, some of your conclusions. And uh, again, thank you for coming in today. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Robert. Thank you, uh, Representative Cox. And to all the testifiers, uh, this meeting stands adjourned. Just as repeat, we will have another hearing on June 4th. Have a great day and a good week. Thanks. Thank